Hi, everybody. Uh, we're going to continue the 2021 Spring Math MCAS, and we're going to pick up where we left off in the previous video. So if you go ahead and look in the video description, there is a link to the digital version of this test. <clears throat> that is exactly like the version taken by the students in last spring. And there's also a printable PDF, which is what I'm writing on here. So the idea is that you've tried these problems al already out, and now you're looking for some guidance. So I'll do the best I can to try to um, hopefully clarify these questions, what they're looking for, and how they're trying to trick you, because that's a big part of it. Okay, let's get started. Number seven, triangle RST is drawn on a coordinate plane. Determine whether each transformation list in this table when performed on triangle RST will result in a congruent figure. For each transformation in the table, select congruent triangle RST or not congruent to triangle RST. And you're given three things here, so you're given three transformations, right? So we have a dilation by a scale factor of 2 with respect to point R, <clears throat> a 540 degrees clockwise, counterclockwise rotation about point S, and a reflection over ST. So you need to understand the difference between rigid and non-rigid transformations in order to get this problem correct. So basically, when you multiply something by 2, the points of 2, it's going to create an enlargement. So the resulting triangle will be larger than the previous one. So it's obviously not going to be congruent. Okay? A 540 degrees clock, counterclockwise rotation, well, rotations uh, do not change the size, nor do they set, change the shape of the preimage, so that would be congruent. And reflections, those also are considered rigid transformations because they do not change the size of the shape, they just flip it. So this is a twist, this is a flip, and this is an enlargement. So this first option would not be congruent, whereas these other two would be. The only way this dilation would be congruent would be as if you're multiplied by a scale factor of 1, which would not change anything. Okay, let's check out number eight. <clears throat> Zoom out a little bit here. Okay. So there's a few ways to solve this. You could try to solve these with elimination or substitution. Um, it would it would take some time because you'd have to see if they all result in the same thing. Um, that would take a long time. A much faster way is to just kind of well, first of all, let's look. we're looking for equivalent. Uh, equivalent equations here. So like this this top equation is the same for all of them. Okay? All of them have 4x plus 9y equals 10. All of them. The difference is in the bottom equation here. <clears throat> so this is 2x plus 3y equals 12. And you have all these different ones here. So that's, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at these. And what I looked at when I solved this, I said, okay, well, this equation needs to be equivalent to the other equation somehow. So I'm either multiplying or dividing this by something to get this other equation, because <clears throat> we know the top equation didn't change. And that's the only way that we'd have the same solution. So there's a little bit of number sense. Well, there's a lot of number sense involved in this problem. So if I look at this, I, I notice we have a 24, 24, 36, and 12. Well, this isn't going to work because the 12 stayed the same, but looks like the 3 changed to the 9. That wouldn't work, because you can't just change one of them and still be the same. Likewise here, it looks like this became 9, this became 36, this didn't change. So they multiplied this and this by 3 to get that. That's out. If you look at this one, <clears throat> uh, it looks like they multiplied 2x and 12 by 2, but nothing was multiplied by 3y, so that's out. This last one, 4x, 6y, and 24. Well, if we multiply this by 2, right, we distribute a 2 across, it would result in 4x plus 6y equals 24. So this is the exact same equation as that. We just distributed 2 across it. So that would be the answer. So I think if you see a problem like this, and you notice the top equation is the same, you have to look at what happened to the bottom equation. And that's, that's really the trick. Say, okay, well, I know this bottom equation needs to be equal to the other equation. It needs to be equivalent, right? And this is the only one where that would happen, whereas you multiply this by 2. Uh, you'd result in this bottom equation. The rest of them are not equivalent equations, and therefore they wouldn't have the same solution. So a deceptively tricky question. Okay, this is number nine. Let's see. Now, this is a quite interesting problem because when I first tried it, um, I did more work than I needed to. And I'll show you, I'll show you I think what I think is a much easier way to solve this problem. <clears throat> So first, let's read it. A data set with an outlier is shown. We have a series of numbers here. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven numbers. Which of the following best describes <clears throat> the effect on the mean of the data if the outlier is removed? OK. 
Okay, so outlier. That's a that's a data point that's so far from the rest of the data that's considered to be a non-factor. So let's look at these. So which of the following best describes on the effect of the mean? The okay. So let's look at the four options. The mean will increase. The mean will decrease. The mean will remain the same. There is not enough information to make a conclusion. So I guess the first thing you should really know is what is an outlier. What, which of these numbers would be the outlier? So an outlier is a number that's either so far from the the min or so or the minimum would be so far from the rest of the data, or the maximum would be so far from the rest of the data that it wouldn't work. Although you could have multiple outliers too. This 75 is going to be our outlier. Okay, you'll notice it's 25 in front of the 50, and you can actually figure this out even if you have just a rough idea of what an outlier is. You could figure this out without even knowing the formula um, of how to calculate the outlier. Um, I won't go into that. The short version is you take 1.5, you multiply it by the IQR, which is the interquartile range, and you use that as a gauge and see if anything is either so far from the Q3 or so far from the Q1 that it is an outlier. I might, what I just said might have sounded like a different language. That's okay because you don't really need to know how to do it. All you need to know is that, hey, there's an outlier here, and this number is further from this than 20 is from 35. This is only 15 away. This is 25. This is the outlier. That's, that's all you need to really know. Now, and if you can get that, then you can do the rest of this. So don't worry about that gobbledygook I just said about how to find the IQR. You don't need to know that. It's useful, but you don't need to do it to solve this problem. So this is the number that's really far away from this. Right? This, is, this is too far. So this is our outlier. Okay? That's what this is. So if we take this out of the data, what would happen? Well, this is this is give three three different situations about the mean. So you need to know what the mean is as well. The mean is the average, right? You add up all these numbers, you divide them by how many numbers are left, and that gives you the average. If you take 75 out, right, what would happen to the average? Well, it's a high number, right? So if you take that high number out, the average is obviously going to go down, right? You're going to have less of an average. If you have a bunch of grades in your class, right? Let's say you have a bunch of, let's say you're struggling, you have a bunch of 75, 70s, whatever, and you have one 95. That 95 is going to help bring the average up. If you take that 95 out, your average is going to go back down, obviously, correct? So the mean would decrease. The mean would go down. That's all. There's actually very little math happening. This, oh, there's some mental math. It's more conceptual. You need to know what the mean is, and you need to know what the outlier is. If you know those two things, you should be able to solve this problem pretty easily. Okay, number 10. Okay, numeral Diaz. Okay, so it's saying here an arithmetic sequence is represented by this function. What is the fifth term in the sequence? So this is testing our ability to evaluate an expression. So the fifth term means n would be 5. So we're going to say f of 5 equals 3 plus 2 times 5. Order of operations tells us we're going to do 2 times 5, which is 10. So 3 plus 10, f of 5, and 3 plus 10 is obviously 13. So f of 5 would be 13. Okay, this is number 11. <clears throat> it's saying to us, the question has two parts. An equation is shown. Drag and drop a number into the box to correctly complete the equation. So we have a series of numbers here. Let's zoom a little bit here. And we have some uh, radicals here. So we have radical line plus radical line equals blank. And then part B, a second equation is shown. Drag and drop a number into each box to correctly complete the equation. All right, so this is really, hey, do you know how to simplify radicals? What's the square root of 9? Well, the square root of 9 is 3, and the square root of 9 is 3, and 3 plus 3 is 6. So that'd be the answer. Six, you just drag it down right in there. Okay. When you solve this on the, uh, on the Chromebook, you're just literally just pick, putting your mouse over that and dragging it down. Okay. This one's a little more interesting. So we have a, uh, a 2 radical 3 and 2 radical 4. So the first thing what we want to do is simplify this radical 4. This is going to stay the same. So 2 radical 3, we can't simplify that. This will become 2 because the square root of 4 is 2, but we already have a 2 in front of it. So we're going to have 2 times 2, which would be 4. So 2 radical 3 times 4. And then this... 4 will be multiplying with a 2 in front. So 4 times 2 is 8, so it'll be 8 radical 3. So you would just drag that there, and you drag that number there. Okay, that's number 11. 
So you can see some of these problems aren't too bad. This one, as long as you know how to simplify that radical 4, you're good. Some folks would have a hard time with that, I can see. Okay. <clears throat> Number 12. All right. So for all real values of x and y, which of the following is equivalent to this expression? All right. So we have negative 3x on the outside, and we have negative y plus 4 on the inside, and we have a bunch of binomials here. So what we want to do is distribute this, okay, and see what we get. So negative 3x times negative y would be positive 3xy, because negative times negative is a positive, and we put these variables right next to each other. Negative 3x plus pos times, sorry, not plus, negative 3x times positive 4 would be negative 12x, okay? Now, you notice these are in different orders. They took these and they changed the order. And that's fine, but you have to remember if you do that, this negative sign needs to go with the 12x. So we're going to say negative 12x plus 3xy. Okay? So you take that negative sign. That negative sign doesn't stay where it is. It has to travel with the 12x. So this would be the resulting binomial, which I believe is right here. Yeah. So that problem, I think everybody can do this, I think. I think this part is actually where... <clears throat> students would make mistakes because I think a lot of students, I think I know they would, I've seen them do it, they would leave, they leave the negative sign here. So don't do that. When you're changing the order, this negative sign is going to travel with that, <clears throat> with that term, okay? So don't fall for that. This is a problem everybody should get correct. Don't fall for that trick if they try it again, which is very likely. Well, I don't know if it's very likely. All right, this is a four-parter. Do we have time for a four-parter? <clears throat> When's this bell ringing? For about 10 minutes. Um... How long is this one? We'll do a separate video for that one. All right, so we're going to stop there at number 12, and we'll pick it up later. Thanks, guys.